Greetings and welcome to this edition of Positronic Hypersonic. I'm Barry P. Cook. I want to talk to you about the latest episode of Star Trek Prodigy. It was called Time Amok, which is interesting, of course, because it's a flip of the title of one of the more iconic episodes of the original series called Amok Time, which is the episode where Spock starts to experience Ponfar and has to go home to Vulcan to engage in the Vulcan mating ritual, which for television purposes was him getting married, <laughs> which doesn't actually occur in the episode, spoiler alert. But anyway, as the episode begins, Janeway is putting the crew of the Protostar through their paces in a riddle type simulation to try to help them learn to work as a team. So they're on the holodeck and they're in an outdoors environment. She's given them a riddle to solve with some objects and crossing a bridge and so forth. And they're trying to figure it out, but they don't really seem to get it together. And out of frustration, Dahl ends up admitting that he and the crew are not really cadets. We then see a scene where the Ferengi from the previous episode ends up getting through to the diviner and rats out the crew, gives him their location. Well, at least the last known location that she has for them. Next, the protostar encounters a tachyon cloud, which messes with the gravity, I guess within the core, the, the warp core, keeping the protostar in the protostar's engine from unbalancing. And that, in, in turn, I guess, keeps there from being a core breach. And when this happens, it basically separates the crew into different time periods aboard the ship, moving at different speeds. So this tachyon wave comes over the ship, and it basically fractures time aboard the ship. And so the crew, who was in, I guess, different rooms of the ship, at the time are also now in different time periods moving at different speeds through time. It was kind of weird. It's, you know, all wibbly wobbly, timey wimey, and hard to explain. Janeway, the hologram, keeps moving between these different pockets of time. I'm not really sure how, but she is. And in each little time pocket, she keeps working with the member of the crew that's in that time pocket with her to try to figure out how they can rebalance the you know, engine so that it doesn't breach and the ship doesn't explode. She works with Rock first, or at least tries to, to see if she can get Rock to help her with this task. But Rock is very frightened of it and very much not confident that she could do it. So she just turns Janeway off. Next, Janeway interacts with Zero in a different time period aboard the ship, but they don't have time to actually build the device that they need in order to rebalance the core, but they do, however, have time to make a schematic of it. So that's what they do just before, in that time period, the ship explodes. Dahl, in his time period, once he's told what's going on, is skeptical that he can build it from the schematics, but he goes for it and seems to succeed, but then he can't install it because there's a coupler that he needs to bridge the, the matrix, the warp matrix, to the cable, I guess, that connects to the core, and there's a coupler missing. So he doesn't, ha he doesn't have it, and before he can find it, the ship in his time zone blows up. Now, while this is occurring, the diviner was somehow able to load a copy of his attack dog, droid guy, into the protostar's vehicle replicator from a distance. Not really sure how he did that. I mean, he had the coordinates, but how did he make that happen? I don't know. But it essentially prints a copy of his attack dog, android guy, and he goes on the attack. Janeway recognizes him as an entity which attacked the ship in the past and thinks he's the one who erased her memory, but he denies that before ordering the computer to erase her, which he does with Chakotay's access code, which is weird and concerning. Gwyn tries to stop him from installing the coupler because he finds the coupler and he's going to install it 
and fix the drive so that the ship doesn't explode and then of course steal the ship and she does this by blowing him out of like a space door airlock type thing but it also blows the matrix out into space and the ship blows up again in that time period back in the time period where rock is she's alone on the ship and after trying to access the deleted Janeway program because she's all alone, she tearfully says goodnight to her crewmates who aren't there and tries to go to sleep but winds up not being able to and she goes to watch a recording of the earlier hollow session before getting a message from the past from Gwyn, which you know, within the ship's computer because she recorded it in her timeline and it's still there later. Anyway, the message relays the schematics to Rock, who then builds and installs it all on her own before also rebuilding Janeway's program from her buffer pattern because she needs Janeway to tell her where it goes. She's then able to fix the ship and everyone goes back to normal time. It turns out that Rock was alone for a very long time. In fact, she was alone for so long that she was able to learn several mathematical and mechanical disciplines during her time in the pocket because it was moving so slowly. And that's how she was able to build the matrix and fix Janeway's program. Then the crew gives each other a big hug and it was just very poignant because the voice actor who does rock is very talented and you feel her aloneness, her loneliness, I should say. You feel her fear, but then you also feel her sense of accomplishment. And it was just very cool. It was very moving and human. And all of these things that I've just described to you made this episode very Star Trek. All the characters go through their own little arcs in this episode and they all sort of learn through the experience how to work together but in separate from separate time periods without being able to actually interact so it was just a very well crafted story and the cast does a great job which i've been saying from the beginning and i just i just every week i can't wait to see the next episode i can't wait to see what they're going to do with this crew before the episode ends though we see that the dreadnought bot Viner's henchman killer robot entity still on the ship from an earlier time period before he was fully built and before he got blown out of the airlock and we see his eye light up so is the computer still building him is he gonna how's that gonna work we're gonna have to see what happens but he's He's no, uh, he's, he's not good news, that guy. But yeah, this is just a great episode. The Star Trek fans on Twitter that I've been interacting with, and it's a very small number, but it's all of them, <laughs> have really liked this episode. It's, it's very Star Trek for a number of reasons, and this show is the best Star Trek show on TV really and truly since Enterprise. At this point, I'm gonna say that Lower Decks is a close second and I can't believe I'm saying that, <laughs> but it is. And you know, Discovery just doesn't get it. Picard got it, but they didn't do a very good job with the characterization and their overall story storytelling technique is lousy, but in terms of the Trek part, they got it, which is good. The trailer for Picard season two just dropped. It looks like it could be good. It's also a time travel thing. So I don't know, maybe there's something about time travel that gets the writers in the right headspace for Star Trek. We'll have to see. It certainly looks good. And, you know, I'm hopeful that Strange New Worlds is gonna be good. I'm just crossing my fingers, but we'll have to see. But anyway, right now, Star Trek Prodigy is the best Star Trek show going. And that's just the truth. So if you haven't checked it out yet, you got to check it out. I will be back with a review of the next episode once it releases. Until then, I wish you all peace and long life.